Susan? I lost the uh, the rights. I'm going to log off and log back in. Okay. Uh, attendees, if you'll just please hold on just a minute. We're having just a little bit of technical difficulty. We'll be right with you. Again, if you're just joining us, we're having a little bit of technical difficulty. We'll be up and running in just a few minutes or less. Susan, are you back with us? Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar with Dr. Jennifer Miskimmons on what is your fracture conductivity anyway? Damage mechanisms and other concerns. Before we start today's webinar, we'd like to ask a few questions about the demographics of our audience. And so I'm going to launch a poll about primary discipline. So what's your primary discipline? So we have a number of people selecting. Looks like uh, we have the majority geoscientists in the audience. Quite a few petroleum engineers as well. Several of you are still voting. So the uh, almost all of you have voted. So I'm going to close the poll and share those results. You can see we have 52% geoscientists, 29% petroleum engineers, 19% petrophysics. So good distribution among different disciplines. So next I'm going to ask you uh, how many years of full-time experience do you have in the oil and gas industry? So that seems to be an easier question. People are voting faster, and uh, we've almost got everyone voted. So I'm going to have go ahead and close that one. Uh, sharing the results, 39% um, of you have over 30 years, and a good distribution among the other years of experience as well. So let me go ahead and hide those results and let me make sure I'm sharing my desktop and I'm going to be um, giving you an introduction to um, Dr. Ms. Kimmons and before we start I'd like to remind everyone that you are muted in today's conference and so you'll be using that uh, same webinar feature to be able to pose your questions throughout the conference and we'll answer them at the, at the end. Um, you will be anonymous, so feel free to ask the questions that um, you want to ask. And so um, as we start our webinar today, uh, Dr. Jennifer Miskimmons is Associate Professor and Associate Department Head in Petroleum Engineering at Colorado School of Mines. Um, she has more than 25 years of experience in the industry. And in between her degrees, uh, she's worked in industry, both for Marathon and for Berea & Associates, and in 2016, uh, she returned full-time to mines. And Dr. Miskimmons specializes in well completion stimulation, hydraulic fracturing, and associated produ production issues. She's the founder and director of FAST, the Fracturing Acidizing Stimulation Technology Consortium. 
and also co-directs the Center for Earth Materials Mechanics and Characterization. And her research focuses on the optimization of stimulation treatments and the importance of such associated recovery efficiencies. We're lucky to have her with us today. And what Jennifer will be presenting today is a sample of some of the material that she covers in the class she teaches for SCA. Uh, hydraulic Fracturing Theory and Practice that's offered in a public setting in uh, June in Houston. And if you'd like to register for that class, here's the information. Uh, of course, you can schedule it in-house as well if you would like to have it at a different time or, or place. And uh, this is one of the series of webinars we've been offering this year. The next ones we have scheduled coming up include uh, Raymond Woodward, he'll be talking about geosteering uh, March 14th, and Jim Smolin will be talking about production logging, and that's in April. And again, SCA is a provider of consulting, training, direct hire, project and studies, so please uh, contact us if you have any more questions. And without further ado, I'm going to give the presentation rights to Jennifer and let her start the presentation. Thank you, Jennifer. All right, thank you. So you can hear me okay, Susan? Yes. All right, so let's go ahead and get this party started. So thank you all for um, coming today or attending. Uh, so as Susan introduced, the um, topic is what is, our, what is your fracture conductivity anyway? And so really what this uh, little webinar pretty short time frame is going to cover is we're going to talk a little bit about uh, propens in general to start with and just kind of make sure everybody's kind of on the same background there and then we're going to get into um, actual fracture conductivity which is a driving mechanism for production of our wells and in that with fracture conductivity what you'll see a lot of times is some pretty significant uh, reservoir damage impacts on that fracture conductivity and what you end up with from a uh, API laboratory test down in your reservoir can be significantly different. So, so from a propin standpoint, um, sounds like with the background that many people have, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with propens, but just a, a quick viewpoint. Um, historically, we have used sand for a very long time. We've also gone through various phases uh, where we have tried things like uh, glass bead, iron shot, just like if you have a shotgun shell shot type of um, material. Um, aluminum in these particular uh, products has been used, plastic. And uh, some of you might have in well history sometime back in the 1950s and 60s seen places where we've used uh, walnut shells or walnut hulls. Um, when you look at propens, you can kind of think of it in terms of a little bit of a triangle. Uh, one peak of the triangle is you're looking at strength. Um, how will these propens uh, crush once they get down into your reservoir? Um, another peak of the triangle is propent transport. And so how well do they move as they um, flow with the fluids out into your fracture? And then the third uh, point you can think of is cost. And so when we talk about current uh, products, and when you start to look at the, um, let me get my laser pointer here, when we start to talk about current products that we're using right now, you can kind of think of that triangle. So sand, very common, common across the, all places in the world. Um, sand has a specific gravity of 2.65, transports uh, reasonably well uh, with most frac fluids. Um, Crushes about 6,000 PSI is what you'll hear most people quote. Uh, that has a lot to do with whether you have point-on-point -point contact with that sand and uh, how angular it is. It can actually crush at a much lower value or it can, it can maintain its strength at a, a higher value. Um, and of course, sand, depending on market value, tends to be one of our lower cost um, options from a profit standpoint. As you move down the, the list here, we start to get into intermediate strength propens. Um, we start to get into the uh, ceramic materials, artificially manufactured ceramic materials. Um, ISPs, depending on the product that you're using, uh, specific gravity is about 2.71, 2.72. 
still a little bit higher than sand, uh, though will crush at much higher um, rates also, probably around 10,000 or so PSI. And, and of course, you start to get maybe into a little bit more cost. As we get into the um, center clays and especially the bauxite, uh, bauxites are our most uh, are our strongest profit. So comparatively, the um, strength of those gets up to, or the crust resistance of those gets up to around 16 or 18,000 psi. Um, but they're also significantly heavier. Uh, they run about a 3.6 specific gravity, give or take. And um, obviously, uh, your cost is going to continue to increase. Um, we can resin coat all of these propens, so RCPs, resin coated propens, whether you're looking at sand or whether you're looking at ceramics. And then we have, I, I guess you can kind of refer to them as a boutique designs, or, or most of the time what we're looking here is um, lightweight type systems. So lightweight systems that are below um, the specific gravity of sand, so 2.65 or less. Um, many of our lightweight ceramics range between 1 and, and 2. Um, uh, specific gravity. And then you're also, this is one place that we've seen some enter, um, some uh, nanotechnology enter into the industry. Um, we're trying to combine some of the um, strength of the artificial ceramic system, but some of the lightweightness um, that you're seeing with some of the lightweight products. So um, unfortunately, the, the cost of those products at this point in time is a little um, prohibitive for most of us. So uh, we, we're, we're using many different areas, many different types of propens um, across our industry. When you look at propens, uh, they are uh, regulated, I guess you would say, by API recommended practices, um, SANS with practice 56. So it's taking a look at size, shape, strength, contamination. And then also high strength propens with RP60, looking at the same um, parameters, size, shape, strength, contamination, just slightly different um, values. But since we're going to be talking about conductivity today, notice that these RPs um, just they just look at um, materials. Uh, they're not looking at the flow capacity or the conductivity of those particular materials. So one of the areas of um, of propens or, or judging propens, of course, are sieve sizes. And we hear a lot about 2040s or 4070 type sieve systems. When you're looking at these sieves, um, for those of you that are not familiar with it, um, the sieve systems that we use are the uh, ASRM type, uh, I'm sorry, ASTM type of um, sieves. If you go on the market and look for sieves, there are many different types of sieves out there, so understand that our industry uses these. And you can see over here on this column where our mesh sizes are actually governed by the opening of the sieve, not the particle size themselves. So it is counterintuitive. The smaller the number um, associated with our with our propens, uh, the larger the opening. And so um, the smaller the number, um, the bigger the propent size. And so if we're looking at a 2040, um, type of sieve system. A 20 has an opening of a 0.84 millimeter, whereas a 40 has an opening of a 0.42 uh, millimeter. So that's showing kind of right here, every fourth screen basically represents a doubling of the uh, particle diameter in this particular sieve size or sieve system. So about that. It doesn't want to go ahead without the laser pointer. Okay, so with the um, propent size and uniformity, when we're looking at that sieve distribution, um, API spec and those recommended practices uh, basically imply that if a product is or a, a propent is a 40-70, that 89.9%, that's 90% here on the slide, uh, but 89.9% of the propent um, actually falls between those two sieve designated. So if you're looking at this particular product here, the um, my sieve distribution right here is showing in the dark uh, red. So that is the weight percentage distribution. And then the um, hash red system back here is my cumulative um, makeup of that particular sieve. 
So when we look at that 2040, again, for a product to be 2040, it has to be between those two um, those sizes. But that's the only regulation that's associated with that. You should understand that, which means that I can have, um, if you watch the laser pointer here, I can have a SIS distribution that shows like this red, or I can have one that crosses and goes very, very, very high up here and then comes back down and can still be that 90% between a 20 and a 40. But that second one that I just drew on there, um, you're going to have a lot more particles that are similar in size. And therefore, just by the size of the particles and the distribution of the particles, that 2040 um, profit could have a significantly higher uh, starting permeability than the one that's shown on the screen right here, um, just because um, of a tighter sieve distribution. And so just kind of keep that in mind when you're looking at profits, that you might hear of a 4070 or a 2040. Um, but all 4070s and all 2040s are definitely not created equal. When we're looking at the shape, um, it sounded like there were a lot of geoscientists on the, uh, the webinar today, so um, kudos to you guys because the engineering world stole this from you. Uh, it's a crumbine scale for looking at particle uh, sphericity and roundness. And what we're looking at from a profit standpoint is if you are a sand, to be API spec, you need to be a 0.6 or 0.6 greater in both the sphericity and roundness. So that puts us up into, um, into this area up here where uh, we're pretty, pretty round, pretty um, um, spherical. When we are a ceramic profit, um, specs, Say that we have to be in the 0 0.7, 0 0.7 um, area or greater. And uh, actually, most profits, most um, artificial ceramic profits are even higher than that. So just kind of keep that in mind that for the most part, we're up here. If you are an API spec, you do not have to use API spec in your well. Um, that's just what the, um, the requirements are. So looking at natural sands, just real quickly here, um, we have. Uh, white sand on the left there and brown sand on the right. Uh, the white and brown colors um, basically come from uh, the uh, crystalline structure and the mineralogy that's associated with those. And if you look at the blue arrows on the right hand side, that it's kind of showing some of the, um, so brown sand has polycrystalline structures to it, whereas the white sand has more of a monocrystalline. And so that polycrystalline structure um, to the, um, on the brown sand, shown by some of those arrows. That polycrystalline structure gives us some failure planes. And so by its very nature, you're going to see a lot more angularity associated with those failure planes and in brown, planes and in brown sands. And um, so again, you can have two sands, white and brown, that are identical sieves, and you'll have a higher permeability associated with the white sand or the true white sand um, because of the better angularity and the very better sphericity that's associated with that. So um, API, the, the recommended practice 56 kind of governs both of these types of sands, but this is one of the differences when you start to see a difference um, in sand products that are available to us with pumps. So another thing to just kind of keep in mind, um, staying with a little bit of a, a close-up, since it's kind of hard to hand out and show you samples in the classroom right now. Um, these are some SEMs that show the white sand on the left-hand side. And again, you can see that they're reasonably round, um, but there is some angularity associated. You can see that big pop mark there um, compared to a ceramic on the right-hand side, much more sphericity. And a lot of that just becomes um, from the manufacturing process themselves. So with all that in mind, um, again, kind of keep in mind that, that all profits aren't created equal. And that's just from the start. Um, that's when they show up on your location in, in a truck. When we get them down now into the reservoir, and this is really what we want to focus on today, is what does that conductivity look like in the reservoir? So first of all, let's, let's define conductivity. Um, conductivity is the permeability of your fracture times the width of your fracture. So by definition, permeability of your fracture times the width of your fracture. So obviously, if you have profit in your um, fracture, 
Um, basically, the permeability of your fracture boils down to the fact that it's the permeability of your profit. So conductivity is therefore, um, when you look at nomenclature, it's defined as KFW. Uh, KF being the permeability of the propent, W being the width of the fracture. So when we're talking about conductivity and uh, we talk about fracture conductivity, uh, just keep in mind that it's that KFW. And that's actually what we uh, tend to buy propens on or compare them to. If you get a spec sheet um, from uh, different uh, companies that sell this, mining companies that sell the naturals or ceramic companies that manufacture um, the artificials, you're going to get a spec sheet that says, here's your fracture conductivity. And so then what we have to look at when we're looking at that conductivity is um, this list when we start to um, see down in the, the reservoir that width component that we purchase our um, product on is going to be impacted by what's the propane concentration in my fracture um, in the in the reservoir. And so propane concentration again, let's just define this for, for some folks that might not be quite as familiar. Um, we talk in terms of propane concentration as pounds of propane between two square feet of reservoir or of fracture face. So Sorry, got a little drawing with my hands here. But if I've got a fracture and I've got a fracture face on this side and a fracture face on this side, and each side has a square foot, it's the propane that's located in between those two. So propane concentration has a big impact. How much propane there on the, the width component of that fracture? Um, closure stress, how much stress is packing that propane in? So you can think of that in terms of closure pressure, or you can think of that in terms of minimum in situ stress. Um, that's going to, the higher that is, the more it's going to pack that profit down together, and you're going to see a lower uh, width associated with that. And then the fracture width can be um, impacted by filter cake and embedment components. And I'm going to show you some pictures here of that in a minute and things to consider in this particular area. When we look at permeability of the propent, then, um, the propent size and strength, which we just took a little bit of a look at, when you think about things like crushing or angularity or how well or not well this um, packs together, um, which leads us into the packing and the porosity, um, and there is definitely an impact on the permeability between those two. And then as we start to look at the permeability associated with um, flowing conditions, what is our regain permeability and our gel cleanup? And this comes from uh, the fluid system. We're going to take a little bit more of a detailed look at that here in a minute. And then also, um, in your fracture, you're going to have some non-Darcy and some multi-phase effects and multi-phase flow components there. Your conductivity, then, is going to directly relate to your effective fracture half length. And your effective fracture half length, you can think of this as this is what drives my production. This is what drives my reserve recovery. Um, the effective half length is going to define your effective wellbore diameter. And again, this is what's going to drive your production. So you can put a fracture thousands of feet out into the reservoir, but that doesn't necessarily tr translate into an effective half length um, because if that fracture does not uh, clean up, um, if that fracture has gel residual in it, if that fracture has um, some damage that we're going to be talking about here in a minute, it's not going to give you that thousands of feet of effective half length. You're probably going to end up with tens of feet. Now, that effective half length then depends on reservoir permeability, um, how well the fluids flow from the reservoir into the fracture and then clean up that fracture. Um, the frac fluid cleanup, how well that fluid gets out of your um, frac fluid itself, how well it gets um, out of your um, fracture to uh, get out of the way of the natural fluids that want to flow into the well bore. Uh, producing water cut and condensate yield. Uh, this goes directly to multi-phase flow effects that we're uh, going to take a look at here in a minute. Um, drawdown, what's the applied drawdown? Um, our reservoirs have a fairly high reservoir pressure, but um, how well does that reservoir pressure transmit um, to the wellbore itself, and how big a flow um, can I generate with it? 
Um, then the created fracture length, I have to get that fluid out there at some point in time and, and that propin out there to um, achieve some of these drawdown conditions. Propin concentration, closure stress, that goes back to the width. And then uh, reservoir rock hardness or another uh, term is you know, modulus, basically embedment. So all of these different areas really impact um, how that fracture cleans up. The conductivity of that fracture goes toward cleanup, and all of these drive um, production. And so bottom line, and this is part of the class, but not really part of the webinar today, but um, our effective fracture length is usually extremely short compared to um, what we would like to expect. So when we're looking at the conductivity, things that damage our profit down in the reservoir, um, we're going to take a look at, at many of these in more details here in the next 25 minutes or so, so I'm just going to run through this real quick, but to kind of give you some, some things to start thinking about. Uh, closure stress as we draw down. Um, propent crushing because of that closure stress and some of the fines that get generated. Uh, fracture uh, propent embedment into the formation. Um, spalling that can kick up from that embedment. Can uh, lead to fines migration, stress cycling. Uh, so, uh, you can, as you as you produce your well, you're generating some uh, pressure into your into your pack that can cause resettling and repacking of that uh, propent pack. Uh, propents will degrade over time, just naturally. Relative perm issues, again, things like um, multi-phase effects non-Darcy effects and, and filter cake and gel residual. When we start to look at all these different damage mechanisms, here is a, um, a slide. Um, okay, so let me let me back up. You're, you're probably watching this slide and trying to, to detail a little bit. Um, before we get to that, about 30 years ago, uh, we started to realize in our industry that when we put propin into the ground, we started to look at the uh, production and things like buildup tests that also give us an indication of effective half lengths. We started to realize that these effective half lengths were significantly shorter um, than the fractures that we were putting out there. And they were also definitely indicating that the conductivity in the fracture uh, was significantly less. Now, 30 years ago when we were testing profits, we would test profits in a conductivity cell. We would put them between two steel plates. Uh, we would flow just water we would flow water at one cc per minute, which equates to about 10 MCF a day. Um, we would flow them for two hours and then measure the conductivity, um, basically measure the permeability according to Darcy's law under those conditions. Now, how many of those conditions sound like your reservoir? Um, I would argue that none of them do. And so there was an industry consortium, a, a joint industry project that started up about 30 years ago, and it's managed by STEM Lab, um, which is a subsidiary core lab. Uh, this particular consortium uh, has studied propens for 30 years, and they have studied these various different areas. And in this consortium, just to give you an idea, um, you'll see major service companies, uh, major operators, you will see independent operators and um, sand, mani or sand mining companies, um, ceramic profit companies. Um, altogether, the, the range of the companies, there's usually about 60-ish members, 60 to 70 members, depending on how many um, folks at that time. So there's a lot of people that have had a lot of input into these areas that have studied these particular areas for a while. And so what we've done now is there is actually now a modified test that has changed. 30 years ago, we tested profits under those conditions I just told you about. Um, now we test profits between not steel plates, but we test them between rock um, plates. We test them in non-Darcy flow conditions. We test them in multi-phase flow conditions because this is much more realistic of what you see in the reservoir. And this is an example, now I'll show you this slide. This is an example of some of the um, tests that have been done and the impacts that these have on um, conductivity. And so what you see on the left-hand side there is the results of what used to be the API test. 
And you'll see three different profits here that give us a conductivity of milli Darcy feet anywhere from 500 up to 7,000. So one of the first changes that has been made in the ISO testing platform now is to have a 50-hour test, not a two-hour test. We then apply non-Darcy effects. We apply the old test said we run at two pounds per square foot. We now run at one. Um, we do multi-phase testing. If you have some kind of gel damage um, associated with the fluids, fines migration, and ultimately cyclic testing. Now, um, if you look, what this is saying is that the product that we purchased under API test basically reduces by 99% down in the reservoir. Um, I ask my students a lot of times at school, you know, how would you feel about getting a 0 0.0? 6% on a test because in essence that's what we're getting. But the thing is that this is this is real. Um, this matches up with production. Um, it matches up with multiple, multiple, multiple hundreds of thousands of um, various tests that have been run in this particular area. And um, this slide has actually been put together by one of the, the uh, owners of these different profits um, to, to be able to demonstrate this, that it's not the profit themselves. It's, it's the reservoir conditions that we're flowing through and that these um, profits are expected to, to act under. So this is actually one of the big disconnects that we see between um, some of our reservoir models and some of our um, uh, assumptions when we look at production is we're not dealing with things that are in the thousands of milli Darcy feet. We're dealing with um, conductivities that are in the tens or less of milli Darcy feet. So when we look at some of these damage mechanisms, just to kind of run you through some of these. Uh, so here we have a plan view of a fracture. And so here's the frac. Um, so I'm looking down. Here's one fracture face. Here's the other fracture face. And so we'll see embedment loss because of the um, uh, embedment of the propin into the formation phase. Um, this is a function of Young's modulus of the formation phase. So the lower the Young's modulus, the more embedment you'll see. And then over here on the right-hand side, what we're seeing is this blue represents filter cake. And the filter cake that's built up from fracturing fluids. And so if you look, I started with an ideal situation where my width of my fracture was from here to up here. And now I'm ending up with a width that is less than half of that um, due to things like embedments falling, um, filter cake, um, left over from the fracturing fluid. So I can have, again, plan view looking down. I can have a fracture that should have been this wide, but now is actually only from here to here. Um, because of that falling and the um, filter cake system. So it's falling. And filter cake create an internal width um, a loss. Embedment creates a more of an external width loss. But bottom line, you end up with a much lower width. And this is just some different propens that um, you can see right here that show conductivity as they decrease under stress. And with things like the embedments, the spalling, and the filter cake um, brought into play. And so you can start to see that um, we lose um, quite a bit of conductivity due to stress. But if, if you were to compare these plots and these um, products to those uh, that were filter cake and embedment aren't considered, you're going to see much higher components associated with those. So now just a, a series of slides to show you some of these um, different impacts on conductivity. Um, some of these slides are pretty busy. Uh, I will apologize for that right now, but they, uh, they're laboratory slides showing some of the different results from some of the different tests. What you see here is the impact of cyclic stress. So consider that you turn your, or your compressor goes on and off, on and off. Every time that a compressor goes down, you send a pressure pulse down into your um, frac pack. And it causes resettling of that pack, and you're going to see an impact on conductivity. And that's what you see with some of these, um, these results over here, is you'll see the repacking behavior associated with that conductivity um, and associated with the cycle. 
what you will notice real quick, and you can really see it on this particular profit down here, it's a 2040 white sand, is the early cycles have much more of an impact, and by the time you get into later cycles, um, that damage mechanism has already occurred. Um, so there's um, moral of the story there, the, the fewer cycles you um, have happen, um, the less impact you're going to have. Um, again, very busy slide. Sorry about that. Um, during the class, we'll go into a little bit more detail on this. Uh, but really what you're seeing here is you're seeing the impact of time on the propens. So the old API, the uh, y-axis, I'm sorry, the x-axis down below is the, um, the time. The old API test was two hours. And so right here you see the two-hour test. And then on the logarithmic scale on the x-axis down here, you're seeing the 50-hour test. And so this is conductivity normalized um, to a uh, time zero. And so all of these sands, which are all 4070 um, resin-coated uh, ceramic systems, they all show a degradation over time. And so again, if we were to use the two-hour API um, test, uh, we would see some overestimation of conductivity. That's uh, now just kind of the time factors. Now we start flowing fluids through the propent. And as we start to flow fluids um, through the propent, so you, you start to flow your well. And as you start to flow your well, you start to move fluids that are closer to the well bore. And then as those fluids get out of your way, you can generate more of a delta P out into the frac pack, and you're going to see more fluid cleanup and more fluid cleanup and more fluid cleanup. And so that's what we refer to as a recursive process, a recursive cleanup process. And um, as that recursive cleanup process um, starts to uh, move away from the well bore, you see more and more of the prop and pack clean up. However, note that there is a maximum distance to which that drawdown can be transmitted. So therefore, you're going to have a maximum distance uh, to which you can get some of this uh, fluid system cleaned up. The gel then that gets left in that profit pack, uh, depending on whether you can get it cleaned up or not, has a pretty good sized impact on retained permeability. So the blue line is retained permeability over here on the logarithmic scale versus the polymer residual that gets left from gel. And as we, uh, again, this is logarithmic, so a little bit of gel residual that maybe we can't get moved out because of that delta P can go an awful long way in um, lowering the permeability um, that's uh, available to us in that profit pack. And then also the red line showing that as you get more and more of that gel polymer residual in the profit pack, um, you need more of a delta P to clean it up. So we're getting less and less delta P as we move away from the well bore, and so it's harder and harder and harder to move out that um, fluid as we um, start to produce the well. Then we start to get into um, things like non-Darcy and multi-phase effects. And so, again, just to kind of give you a little bit of a taste of some of this, um, when we talk about non-Darcy, this part of the equation, and I promise I'm not going to throw too many equations at you, but this part of the equation right here describes linear flow. And as we get away from linear flow, we get into Porsheimer or non-Darcy. The original API test put us in here. Most wells, if, unless it's a stripper well, you're up in this range of flow velocities. And so when we start to look at the impact of um, non-Darcy flow, and you can think of non-Darcy flow in terms of Reynolds numbers, what we're seeing here is this blue line. This is linear flow, and this is Darcy type of flow. But as we get into higher and higher and higher flow rates, we see the impact of non-Darcy flow um, turbulence and inertia on us. And what the y-axis over here is the degradation of this Darcy flow, which is what the API test originally was showing, down into non-Darcy flow. Okay. The thing is, is on this type of curve, most of our wells, if you have a couple hundred MCF or you're producing a couple hundred barrels of fluid per day, you are down here in this range. And so if you look, pretty significant loss in permeability due to non-Darcy effect. Throw in a little bit of multi-phase. 
Um, this is just showing um, the impact of having 100% gas saturation down to 25% um, gas saturation. Again, you see the curvature due to the non-Darcy effect, but then you also see the multi-phase effect start to pull in. And this is where we, again, really start to see that um, conductivity available to us to produce start to degrade. Um, in interest of time, I am just going to leave that plot for now. We can talk a little bit about it later. Um, but uh, if you if come to a class, I guess, but you can answer some questions. So one thing to really um, start to consider, too, when we start to look at um, propent cleanup and, and the conductivity available to us is uh, rocks are not homogeneous in any way, shape, or form. And so they don't clean up uniformly either. And so if my fracture, the hydraulic fracture that I place is down here, as I start to draw, so plan view looking down, sorry. As I start to draw down my fracture, the pressure in my fracture by producing my well, I start to get breakthrough down here with the um, fluid system and from my reservoir, my reservoir fluids. And as my reservoir fluids flow into the fracture and start to flow along the fracture to the well bore, because of capillary pressure, I'm left with some areas that um, may never clean up. And if they don't clean up, um, the conductivity is going to be impacted by that also. So you're talking capillary pressure. We're talking the fact that rock pore um, spaces and pore throats have varying diameters associated with them. And so what this figure is showing is I also have various um, conductivity, uh, or sorry, capillary pressures associated with those. And so another way of looking at um, fluids as they start to break through and start to clean up in a fracture is here's my, okay, so the geologists on the phone can make fun of this, but these are my rocks, okay? These are my rock grains right here. So yeah, they're not always square, but rock grain, rock grain, rock grain. My fracture in this particular instance is over here. And now I have fracturing fluid that has leaked off and imbibed into my reservoir and my fracture face. And that's what the blue, or sorry, the green is representing. Over here, the blue is representing now my um, reservoir fluids that want to come to the right and um, be produced uh, to the well bore. And as we start to produce these fluids and we start to apply drawdown, I start to get breakthrough of that reservoir fluid system down here. And once I do that, I might clean up a little bit more. You can see me flipping between these two slides. I might clean up a little bit more fluid, but once I get breakthrough here, all of this fluid in this part of the fracture is probably going to stay there. It's not one I want to produce down into my um, fracture uh, over here and be produced out of the well bore because I start to lose um, any kind of drive due to that breakthrough of capillary pressure. This is just some work that was done in a lab. And you can see this is a frack pack. Um, it's a just profit pack in here. We pumped blue water into this. And this complete, this uh, sand pack was completely saturated with water. And then we started to flow nitrogen from left I'm sorry, from right to left. And once that nitrogen broke through, it cleaned up a little bit of the fluid system. But now um, I get breakthrough and I can't get any more of this fluid. Now in the lab, I can switch directions. I can flow back the other way. And even when we, so I'm flowing from left to right, even when we do that, we still can only uh, clean up some of the fluid. Some of the fluid's always going to be left in the frack pack here, in the problem pack once we get breakthrough. So keep that in mind um, as we start to try and clean up fluids and all the other damage mechanisms that go along with the conductivity that we've already discussed and what impact that might have on your um, fracture fluid flow. And so this is just a, a, a picture from Nelson, um, shows the diameter of width um, of the of pore throat systems. The conventional reservoirs that we always worked up, up here, 
we're now down into the shale systems down here. And so think back to that capillary pressure and how much smaller those tubes are and um, how much harder it might be to pull some of that fluid back out um, of our reservoir from a production standpoint. Um, also then start throwing into horizontal well um, considerations and the complexities uh, associated with horizontal wells. So here's my horizontal well shown in green. Here's my fracture plane, my very nice, ideal, wonderful little square fracture plane here. And now start thinking about all the damage mechanisms that we discussed in this particular fracture plane, all that fluid trying to clean up and get into this wellbore. Now here I'm also working against gravity uh, because gravity um, wants to pull some of that fluid down and we might even end up with some coning around this particular area. So bottom line, we are ending up with um, conductivity systems that are significantly lower um, than um, expected. Uh, again, it's not unusual to see your conductivity be 95 to 99% lower uh, than what some of the original API tests um, accounted for. Fortunately now, for about the last 10 years, we do have ISO standards um, that conductivity are being measured under, but uh, those ISO standards, you need to ask questions about the profits that you are using and are they being considered with those ISOs so that you can make sure that you're comparing the apples to apples. Um, these, lead, these, these lower conductivities then lead to other potential issues. So for instance, if you think that you have Darcy's of conductivity, your assumptions for other areas could be um, incorrect. So basically what we're saying is if you think that you have Darcy's, of um, permeability, then you might um, assume that your fracture half length um, is significantly longer or shorter, depending, I guess, which way you go, and um, uh, you can anchor wrong and anchor incorrectly and make some very big errors on what um, drainage profiles might look like. So think about the fact, for those of you that do numerical simulation, you know, how do you model your hydraulic fractures and your numerical simulations? Are you accounting for um, this reduced conductivity that's taking place in the reservoir? And the thing is, I want to stress, not the profits' fault. Please don't think that. I'm not bashing on profits. Um, it's, it's not. It's a combination of multiple factors, and um, most of these are reservoir-driven. Um, our reservoirs are pretty nasty places, and uh, we're expecting these um, profits to behave and um, contribute to production under conditions that they're just not set up to do so. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Susan and um, I'll let her uh, handle some questions. Great. Uh, we're already starting to get some questions from our audience. I'll remind our listeners today that if you would like to pose a question, you are muted, so you'll need to type your question into the GoToWebinar question box. So the first question, I've been trying to find information on the rate of density of fracture decrease from the well bore. The only studies I can find show only a few fractures 100 feet from the fracked well. Those fractures only have a few grains of sand. Where do all those tons of sand go? <laughs> yeah, they, they don't just disappear, right? Um, so the thing is, is you have to think in terms of really the, the volumetrics, I guess. Um, so when, you know, you can think of fractures as one plane, very likely they're not, very likely we do have some multiple planes out there and, and um, um, both in the direction uh, away from the well bore, but then also um, some cross-cutting fractures that are associated with that. When we start to look at those, even though you're seeing, um, you know, fewer fractures away from the well bore, um, what we do see is the surface area and the contact area that we're creating is actually millions and millions of square feet. And so uh, with your question, it's, it's, it's a little tough to answer because sometimes um, if you're talking conventional reservoirs versus shales or unconventional, um, slightly different volumes there. But think in terms of the fact that for the most part, we're creating millions of square feet. And so that profit does have a lot of places to go. Um, volumetrically, it has a lot of places to go. It does turn the corner, and so um, it does, a, a propent 
for, for a proffin to turn the corner and get into a cross-cutting fracture, whether that's a hydraulic fracture or a natural fracture, the fracture width only needs to be um, the size of the proffin. Um, you don't need significant width associated. So if you think back to one of the original slides, um, you know, if I've got a, a sieve uh, opening a 0.84 for a, for a, um, a, a proffin particle that's a 20, that's the only size that I need for that fracture. So proppants will turn the corners. They will fill up that void fairly significantly. And um, it, it, those millions of pounds are out there. Um, they're just spread out. Now, um, again, from a production standpoint, if you're not seeing production that you assume should be associated with millions of square feet, well, that's due to those conductivity losses that we've been talking about. The next question refers to a certain slide. So I'm going to ask you to go back to slide 17. Okay. There we go. And the question <clears throat> is, what exactly is a cycle? Oh, a cycle. Okay. Um, wow. It wants to do things on its own. Um, okay. Uh, okay. I'm just gonna leave it there. Um, a cycle is a uh, any. Think of it in terms of any pressure pulse that uh, goes into that profit pack. So one thing, one way to think of it is a cycle is if you have a gas well on compressor lift, a cycle is basically any time that that compressor goes down, the compressor goes down and all your pressure builds up and goes back into that profit pack. Now I start the compressor back up, I apply drawdown, that's a cycle. That cycle, now that cycle could take place in an hour, your compressor goes down and goes back up, or your compressor goes down, you don't get it fixed for a week and it comes back on. It's not the time, it's that downtime. And so those are both describe a single cycle. So same thing with like a your submersible pump in an artificial lift system goes down. You bring it back on an hour later or you bring it back a week later, um, that's considered a cycle. Okay. The next question is a two-part question. What is the distribution of propant along the fracture length, and does this vary with the fracture plane above and below the well? Yes. Um, second answer, or second question, yes. It varies. Um, and the thing to keep in mind is, again, go back to the fact that your rocks are not homogeneous. And so as I'm creating this crack in the rock, um, I have fluid that's leaking off faster in some parts of the rocks and other parts because it's higher permeability versus other rocks that are lower perm. And so that fracture phase, this whole fracture phase, has varying permeability along it. And so there you're going to have varying um, leak off along that. And so the density of your fluid is actually dynamically changing. And you're creating pockets of, in essence, um, sand that the fluid is all leaked off and you've got sand left there and you've got other places where you have enough fluid left to continue to move the profit. So think in terms of you've kind of got these um, packs of profit that are spread throughout your, your fracture and it's really due to the heterogeneity and the leak off characteristics of that particular um, rock. And so yeah, you'll see if you have a, um, a set zone that let's say your reservoir is 20 foot thick, you're going to have um, fluid leaking off at different rates due to the uh, heterogeneity of that 20 foot thick reservoir. But also now if your fracture is growing into non-pay zones above and below, you're going to have significantly different leak off there too because um, making the assumption you're going to have different permeability in those zones also. Great. The next question is, do propants enter the natural fracture system? Yeah, they really do. Um, as long as you have fluid um, that's going into that natural fracture, you can pretty much bet that you're going to have profits going with them. Again, it just it just really depends um, on what the width of that natural fracture is, but it does not have to be very big. For the most part, if it's, if it's accepting fluid, um, you're probably going to get some profits turning the corner. Um, if, if it's if it's just a little wide. Now, we do have situations, understand that we do have situations if those natural fractures aren't wide enough or don't get pressurized open enough to accept profit. 
So you can have certain situations where you have just fluid going into those natural fractures, but we do have a lot of situations where you can have profit and fluid going into those natural fractures. Okay. What are your thoughts in terms of frac fluid cleanup and effective half lengths in today's large slick water treatments? Um, so, so slick water, one of the benefits of slick water, of course, is, is you don't have to have gel and you don't have to have, um, you don't have to have the, um, uh, the gel cleanup behaviors. However, you still have to have enough delta P to clean up through that, um, through that entire system. So our reservoirs are, are high pressure, one of the one of the reasons we can produce them, but they also don't have a lot of transmissibility because there's not a lot of permeability associated with them. So um, you you still you can put fluid way out into a reservoir, you can still put propent way out into the reservoir, but now um, that fluid has to be able to find its way back to the well bore um, based on reservoir pressure and delta P to your well bore alone. Not, you're not going to have all those hydraulic pumps on surface helping you generate that pressure to carry it out and crack the rock. Now the rock's healed back up. It's got that propent in it, but again, that conductivity is fairly low. So um, it really has a lot to do with the delta P and um, that's, that's associated and available to you. And if we lose that delta P pretty quickly, um, you're not going to get clean up from a, from a fairly significant distance. Do you know whether operators are considering using 4D time-lapse seismic data in studying variations in fracture conductivity? Fracture conductivity. Um, so fracture conductivity is tough. Um, what I do know is there are some projects, I'm, I'm actually worked on a project fairly recently where we did use some um, 4D seismic, where we actually um, shot a 3D shoot before uh, all the frac treatment. So it's, it was a it's a square section, um, one mile by one mile, with 11 wells, um, stacked pay wells, horizontal, and we shot a 3D seismic before, completed all the wells, shot a 3D seismic after the completion, and then shot another 3D seismic um, two years into production. What we were looking for there was basically saturation changes and fluid changes, which which we could see some of. The thing with fracture conductivity is that's a, a scale issue. I think when we start to talk about um, when we start to talk about the seismic area, so I think we're kind of headed in that direction. Um, but we've got to we've got to connect those scale issues um, somewhere along the lines, and I don't think we're to that point yet. Similar question, are there models available that can model the degradation of fracture conductivity with time? Um, yes. So there are, um, okay, so there are analytical models that are available. Um, I've actually had a PhD student publish some on analytical models. Um, there is a numerical model. In fact, since my screen wants to go to this slide, this is what I'm showing it. Um, <laughs> The, uh, in, and I'm not, I'm not here to sell software, but the, the consortium that has studied this degradation, they've developed a software package that's called PredictK. Now, it's not commercially available. It's only available to the members of the consortium, but it's available to the rest of the industry, mainly because, like I said, a lot of service companies um, are members of that consortium, and so they have access. Um, to that particular numerical simulator. Um, the, uh, the analytical solutions, though, if you want to go out and publish or, or predict them yourself, the analytical solutions are basically all published. Please comment on near wellbore complexity. <laughs> okay, um, so that I, I laugh because that's a that's another hour webinar, um, but. <laughs> Really, so near well bore complexity, first of all, you're going to have it. Um, when our fractures initiate from a well bore, if you're in a vertical well, um, you have the potential for fractures to initiate out different perforations and um, grow out along the cement sheath and, and create some near well bore complexity there. Um, in a horizontal well, 
you're going to have a lot more near well bore complexity. Um, the quickest way I can get you to think about it a little bit is in a horizontal well, think about the fact that when you when you cook a sausage and overcook it, it wants to split longitudinally. Um, most of our hydraulic fractures, even if they're drilled, even if a horizontal well's drilled to um, create transverse fractures, they want to initiate from the well bore longitudinally to start with and then grow into um, transverse systems because you get away from the near well bore stresses and you get more far field um, control and so the stress will start to control far field. So bottom line what that suggests is you're going to have a lot of near well bore complexity. The thing is is those sometimes those longitudinal splits along that horizontal well can actually enhance your conductivity a little bit um, because now I have multiple places for fluids to flow into my well bore along the horizontal. Um, however, when you're producing or when you're pumping the fracturing treatment, um, that can add a lot of torch velocity and lead out the screen out. So um, the question is extremely multipart. Um, bottom line, you're going to have some torch velocity, you're going to have some complexity, and depending on what you're doing, that can be a good thing or um, it can cause you some problems. Okay, I think we've run out of time today for questions. Thanks to our audience for all their great questions, and thanks for attending today's webinar. Later today, you'll receive a link to a recording of today's webinar that you can share with your colleagues. We'll get an evaluation form out to you, and we'll send you a link to the registration details for Dr. Ms. Kimmons' class on hydraulic fracturing theory and application that's scheduled for June in Houston and also in November in Houston as well. Thanks for attending. Bye.